Well, hi guys, welcome to Lock Jam, our first ever Lock Jam. Um, big uh, round of applause for Aileen for um, getting this up and running. It's a, you put a lot of effort to just get the event up and running, like uh, worldwide, uh, getting a game that we can all localize. And um, yeah, you can imagine all the work that he's put in. Um, so yeah, we'll get started, um, and I'll just go through a presentation about Lock Jam as well as how I'd approach the actual translation of this title if I was one of the participants. Uh, yeah, you give me the nod. Okay. Yep. okay. Um, yeah, so basically I assume that most of you know that we've got Lockjam Org up and running. That's where you can download the kit that has the game and all the details in it. So uh, basically you can just uh, look at that and go through and uh, translate it. Uh, and then when you're finished, you end up putting up your uh, file, or tra translate me file, back up onto the website and that's how it will be scored. Um, so all the details are there, it should be pretty obvious, so um, yeah, um, please just follow that. Now, why should we participate? Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, that one. Uh, so why should we participate? Um, those are the three points I've uh, put down is basically, yeah, um, if you're a non-professional translator looking to get into the industry, this is a great stepping stone. Um, so you guys at the back, if you want to grab a seat, uh, anyway, feel free to just jump down here. Um, yeah, so... Uh, if you're yeah, new and you're looking to get some experience, this is a great way to get experience because if I was an employer about to um, interview somebody that had come in and said that they're interested in translation but they haven't any experience, but they've done lockdown, that's one you know, mark that you can add to your resume because particularly if you win it, that'd be even um, better that if you won it and you came in here and said like, um, yes, I'm looking for a translation job and I won lockdown, um, that means that you know, translation agencies have seen your work and have said that it's the best out of a large group of pe people. So um, it is an experience and also um, if you just want to do it for a mental exercise to see what goes into translation. If you're interested in perhaps looking into lo localization of games as a future career but you don't know where to start, well this is a good mental exercise to see what the process is. Um, yeah, and of course if you are a professional uh, translator this would be even better because you will get um, prizes as well, which uh, include licenses to some of the lock tools that are out there. So there's a, a few good reasons to uh, this thing. Okay, and so who am I and why am I here? Well, um, yep, I'm Richard. So I've been uh, in the lock industry, or game lock industry, for over 20 years now. Uh, originally, it started off in, uh, even before what's listed there, I started off as a programmer for arcade games. Um, makes me feel really old when I used to talk about that, but yeah. So that's, I actually started off as a programmer and then um, I set up my own company. We're doing uh, 64DD games, which probably no one's ever heard of, but um, there was a hardware called 64DD that got cancelled along with the two games I was working on. So I ended up quitting that company or we actually um, destroyed that company and then I uh, moved off and I applied to Square Enix as a programmer originally for Final Fantasy team. And halfway through the interview process, they said, we want you to interview again because we've got this idea of starting a localization department. And I'm like, what's localization? I'd never heard of it before. And, you know, I'd always translated the games I'd worked on up to now, but didn't realize that's what it was called. Um, and Square said, yeah, um, since we found a good person that fits the role that they wanted, um, they said, well, how about we start, start up a localization department? So, um, yeah, for the first five, six years, I was on the Square side. And then when the merger happened, um, they moved me away from the Square side and put me onto the Enix titles in order to uh, improve their localization. They lost their localization team as well, so I took over the Enix side of things for a while. But um, basically, yeah, I wore many hats there. Um, and then uh, way back in 2007, um, Blizzard Entertainment headhunted me and said, we want you to run our localization department in America. So I went over to Blizzard and um, worked there for three years. Uh, built up the localization department from just a few translators that were working on World of Warcraft at the time to a massive team worldwide. Uh, we had offices in Korea, China, uh, France and Brazil um, as well as in the US and each, uh, t each country had different languages running there so in Europe you'd have like four or five European languages running out of our office. Um, each team would have eight translators, eight testers, plus in the US we also had a shadow team um, as backup so we could run World of Warcraft 24 hours um, and so that you can imagine the apartment was quite big, it was over 120 people and then we split, uh, split off Lock QA away from localization 
So we just had the transfers under me and I moved the lock QA guys back to the main QA department. Um, yeah, and uh, we increased more and more languages, uh, as well as the languages we did internally, ran all the ops source languages, so it was over 20 languages that we were dealing with there. And so basically I was running that department and it was fantastic, one of the best companies we'd ever worked for. Uh, in 2011 I moved back to Japan because I wanted to uh, have a change and instead of a Western companies spreading worldwide, try again, again to have another Japanese company succeed in the West. And I thought Level 5 was the right company, um, so I uh, just emailed the uh, CEO because I'd worked with him before. And they said, do um, you guys want to have a localization team? I don't know what that is. Sure, come join us. So I joined them. And, um, <laughs> it, worked, it was fine for a couple of years, but the trouble is they didn't have any titles. They, most of their titles were done by Nintendo. So after two years, I'd worked on Inukuni and all the other multi-platform um, titles for them, but they only ran our titles. So I decided to go freelance because I'd never done freelance before. And yeah, for the last year, I've just been um, working as a freelance translator. So yeah, I've seen all aspects of the uh, lock industry from the dev side right through to uh, out external uh, freelancer. Yeah, so there's some of the titles I've worked on over the years, but um, the crazy amount when you start to look back at all of them, they're the ones I can remember I could um, <laughs> type down. But yeah, so it's got some yeah uh, pretty major titles like Chocolate mm. Racing, everybody's played, everyone knows of course. No, um, but yeah, you got uh, all different types of. Uh, levels of uh, games I've done, so uh, for this title, for instance, I think I've got enough experience explaining to you guys how to approach it. So we'll move on to uh, the next slide, please. Okay, that's going to be how to read. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to be talking about how I would actually go about translating this title if I was one of the participants, but also I'll give you some insight from uh, like a vendor, like an um, external translation agency point of view, as well as from the actual dev team point of view about how things will be run in detail, but we use this as sort of a micro case. Like, we'll still talk about the same ideas that go into a large scale project, but how to apply it for this, that's only a very small uh, title. Um, I helped write the uh, best practices document that's up on the IGDA website. Um, so uh, I'll be basing the talk off of that today. Uh, feel free to make a note of this, or you just go to um, our websites, uh, they've all got links to this. But um, we've got it both in Japanese and English up there, and it will basically teach you all you need to know about uh, the best practices of game localization. And I know a lot of the companies in Japan as well as worldwide now have used that in their de uh, departments just to get an idea, like the basic knowledge and how to apply it to their company. So uh, that's what that, I made that document. It's very detailed. Um, but yeah, if you're interested in game localization, definitely check that out as a starting point. Um, so yeah, we'll talk about the what's in that document as well. Um, basically, there's, depending on the project, but usually there's about seven steps to uh, localizing a title. And um, so we'll go through each of those and apply it to this little title that we've got up and running right now. Um, so yeah, we'll, as we move on to the next slide, we'll go for each day. You can see this is what our normal game uh, localization would sort of look like. Um, so it's a bit hard to read there, but you can see you got like a preparation time, you've got familiar, uh, familiarization time. Now this is one thing that most companies don't want to pay for and therefore it gets, uh, like a lot of people don't do it, but you really need to have a knowledge of the game. Um, so I didn't realize how bad it was until I actually went freelance and realized that they expect you to play a 100 hour video game for free before you start translating. Um, I was a bit surprised because up to now I've always paid for my translators to uh, familiarize on the games. But, um, for this project, it's very small. You could literally just play through it in an hour easily. So um, we'll be applying that uh, as well. Um, and then you can see the other steps we go through from uh, what we just had listed before. This is down there. You can see that more complex titles have voice recording as well as things running in parallel. You might have some translators translating, handing off files to editors, like literally a week behind them. And you might have like the project I just uh, worked on it up to last week was we had about six translators working in parallel with each other, so it can get quite complicated. Most translators just focus on, um, you know, just their little bit that they're given, but it's best to know the big picture so you can work in with the other people and everybody's not translating differently, and we'll talk about ways to avoid that. So yeah, um, and basically we'll go on to the first step, would be the familiarization and prep work. As I said, it's something very important that a lot of companies 
don't do, but for us it's very easy for this project because we'll just download the package from Lockjam website and then we can, the first thing I recommend you do is look over the files and see what's in there. It's very easy because we've just got one file that we are meant to translate. Um, you can just click on uh, HTTP um, link in there and it will actually load your game up on screen. You can actually change the text and see it reflected real time up there. So it's uh, like very easy to do the familiarization part, prep work. Now, one thing that if you're a freelance translator or even working inside a company that you need to know about is how to do a proper word count. The easiest way for us to do it on this project would be just to take the whole row or column out of the, um, the file and dump it into Word and Word will count how many words are in there and uh, tell you a rough estimate. Where things get tricky when you're dealing with uh, translation vendors or development teams is that, you know, what do you do with, like, your to in Japanese they call them tokens, but in English we usually say macro, um, like you have the, all the codes inside the text and some companies will say, yeah, we don't want to pay for that, like, if, but that's not something that's translated, that's just something you copy and paste across the so translation houses and, and um, dev teams often say they don't want to pay for it, but then you'll have other translation houses that say, yeah, we'll, we actually count them as words, even things like um, white space. If you're doing, like, a translation from Japanese, uh, you have to decide whether white space is counted or not, because it is characters, and word will give you both, will give you both one that has you know, spaces, counted and not counted in your moji count or your uh, character count and you have to make sure that you, you're very clear with the people you're uh, having a contract with about whether that's counted or not. Uh, another um, one that's been an issue is like uh, slash ends that we have, like it looks like an end mark and um, end when written on screen in uh, the Japanese but um, basically at the backslash end there. Um, if you, do you count that or not? And in this project, you wouldn't count it uh, because really, you should be just typing it, not really worrying about uh, how many words is in there. But for instance, if I was a vendor or a translation company, I'd allow people to count gov, which is a macro or a token that appears throughout the text. Yeah, let's yeah. make the context. Gov is uh, in the game that we are, you are going to translate is replaced uh, by the spoiler either Republia or Democria. The whole game changes uh, the the name of the country you're in yeah. for story reasons. Yep. So which could screw up things, but uh, <laughs> that that's in there. But would uh, for a purpose of a, a character count, would count that as a word. Um, so th these are things to be aware of when you're dealing with translation vendors or development teams about what you can count, and what you can't count. You've got to be very clear about it. Small projects like this probably doesn't matter, but when you're talking about something the size of World of Warcraft or something like that, we're talking thousands of dollars in, in pay difference there. So we've got to make sure that both sides are happy with it on, on the contract um, side of things even before you start translating. Okay, we'll move on to the next. Um, so yeah, I did a word count that it's really hard to see, but 1,787 words, which is small. Um, enough to translate in a day or so, but uh, on the flip side of that is it's only 1,787 words for you guys to prove how good at translators you are, like to the judges of this contest. So it's good and bad, it's like it's a small amount of text, but at the same time it's only a small a limited amount of text to prove your worth in. So um, now the prep side of things, you should know your speed. Uh, just for reference sake, if you're a Japanese to English translator, then you, like, um, Generally, we would count about 4,000 moji per day, like for an eight hour day, as what would be a reasonable workload for most translators on average. Everybody's different, of course, so you should know your own speed. Um, the same for English into uh, Japanese, for instance. Well, it changes very di dra dramatically. I'm sure that some of the translators here have different speeds, but usually for estimation purposes, about 2,000 words per eight hour day per translator. Um, and, but, as we all know, it, it differs depending on the content too. If it's very uh, highly characterized text or uh, very difficult, like our system text or whatever, sometimes that can uh, be way slower. Okay. Going on. <laughs> um, so yeah, you're basing off the 1,787 words that we have there. That's one day's work for one translator. So really, you could do it this weekend if you uh, wanted to. Now. Uh, one thing I mentioned that the steps there was that you have uh, editing as a phase. So uh, as a big com company or a uh, smaller company you would say that uh, one editor can usually handle three to four translators output per day. 
So you'd, if you have three translators, you'd probably put one editor on the project and have them working parallel, basically, with the uh, translators. So on this project, how we apply that would be that you, you want to allow yourself about a third of a day, or at least two or three hours, um, to have somebody proofread your text or you look over the text yourself. Um, so with the, and the next stage, um, we haven't that this before, was integration and um, like integration and testing. And uh, there would basically uh, just give a couple out, like literally you can, this game you can actually just plug the text in and um, see it on screen straight away. So integration and testing shouldn't take too long. Um, so basically the next step would be uh, creating your glossary and your style guides. This is something too that a lot of companies don't care about and a lot of freelance translators just take the text and translate without thinking about style, thinking about um, how the wording is going to affect it. So they do it as they go rather than thinking ahead and planning. Now I'm the total opposite. I'm, I like to get everything set out perfectly, like what language are we, what tone of language are we translating into, what type of um, feeling are we giving the game. So uh, my first step in that would be to write a list of terms. I just quickly went through this and um, typed up some of the terms that appear in there. Um, and you get a feel of what the world is in English from the, those words. And now you start to think about your target language, uh, what type of language you want to put that in, uh, into in your own, uh, you know, whether it be figs or Japanese, what, what level of language you want to do. So you can see these are some of the game terms as well as just uh, names that will appear in there. Um, we're f because it's localization, we're free to change that around. We'll go with the next slide. So, looking at that text, you've got the feel of a dictatorship or some type of communism or socialism going on. You've got mentions of orphans, soldiers, army, navy, spy, satellites, rebels, terrorists. Obviously, there's some like pretty dark things going on. Um, and then, basically, your job is to censor a newspaper. So it's like Big Brother, as if you've ever read 1984. But um, basically, yeah, you're there to. Um, some of the words there will give you hints that you've got to increase public loyalty. So basically you're a propaganda machine. Uh, edit carefully, in other words, don't say anything bad about the government. Um, so these are some of the things that's going on there. Now that will help you think, well, how am I going to translate this? Then um, they, they even mentioned that they've got your family um, held hostage, which, like uh, the way they word it too, it's, it's not totally dark, it's sort of humorous in a way. So you can see there's a lot of irony and dark humor going on in this title that will help give you an indication of how to apply it to your language. Of course, every culture is different of what you can and can, cannot get away with. Um, in some languages, for instance, or some uh, cultures, for instance, you wouldn't make fun of this. Like, it'd be very difficult, for instance, in South Korea, to sort of be making sort of that type of joke because the public probably won't accept it. Um, same if you're in China, etc. You'd, you'd have to be very careful how you'd walk, uh, walk that line. But in other countries, you could probably be very uh, ironic and uh, funny about it. So start to think about how you're going to translate it, what, how you're going to you, like render those words, but also about the language itself. Um, but it's not just about, you know, uh, we're not talking just about translation here, we're talking about localization. So for this contest in particular, how to stand out from the crowd is not to do a direct translation and just render everything that's in, like in English into katakana or whatever, and if you're doing Japanese, but or other languages you probably want to mix it up a bit to stand out from the crowd and do something that's different for your culture that you know, only people in your culture could understand. Um, one of the goals of localization is to make it feel like that game was made for that audience by that audience. So if it's, if you're, if it's originally an English game and you bring it to Japan, it should feel like it was written by Japanese for Japanese. Same vice versa. Japanese game from the West, when they receive it, it might the graphics etc. might look a little bit Japanese, but when they actually play the, the game, the text should feel like it was written in their language originally. That's one of the goals that you should always have. Um, of course, it depends on the title. Some titles you might prefer to even do just a direct translation and keep the original feel of the world. But other, um, it's case by case cool, but other titles you might want to totally change it. Um, so yeah, we'll go on to the next slide. Um, so yeah, these are some ideas like I just threw out there. Like um, I'm assuming some people speak Japanese and people speak Japan, but uh, we could do the setting could be wartime Japan, for instance, since we did have propaganda in Japan um, back in the war years um, where people were censoring newspapers. So if you wanted to be very creative, you could be pre-war Japan, or you could totally flip it and do future Japan where suddenly all the kanji looks like Chinese simplified 
from Kanji, and we're talking about some future world where the same type of Orwellian nightmare is going on and you're uh, basically editing newspapers. Um, or you could pick, set it in you know, one of your neighboring countries like Russia, Korea, China. Um, and so I, as a joke, I've sort of thrown in ideas. Of course, I wouldn't ever uh, assume anybody would ever do this, but these are just ideas that you could throw in there and, and have a bit of fun. Like I said, you could basically write it as if you were in China, or you could write it as if it's set in Korea or uh, Russia, because, you know, even the English feel sort of tends to be Eastern European. So, yeah, you could have fun with the, um, the language there. Now, as I said, these are extreme examples, uh, but you could, just ideas, like, um, I'd really like to see somebody do something different, like uh, you could do historical Japan, like um, during the Bakufu or the, like, uh, pre-Meiji era, or even samurai periods, just write it from that perspective. You could use ancient Japanese, classical Japanese, and have fun with the text. But the important thing is to do is, um, be creative but also respect the source material so you've got to walk that balance like if you're working um, with a development team and they're okay with you changing setting and uh, playing around a lot more than just a direct translation then you can do a lot like um, I've if you've probably seen some of my work for instance if there's a Osaka accent inside the game what do you give that in English well I gave it a like for instance in Nidoku we gave like a fairy a Welsh accent which is pretty random out there, but then, well, how else are you going to represent an Osaka accent in an English game compared to just your standard Tokyo English text? So you've got to think about that type of thing, characterization, but of course you've got to talk with the development team and um, the creators that you don't go too far. Um, you know, other titles like Dragon Quest, for instance, if you ever play Dragon Quest in Japan, it's always text only, no voice. Um, we spoke with Horisan and begged him and really uh, pushed our case for a long time and he finally folded and allowed us to add voice to Dragon Quest in Dragon Quest 8. And um, yeah, it was, that was a big change for them, but it made the game feel way more modern than if it was just text with the PPP sound going on in the background and it totally changed the feel of the game. And we went further with that, the graphic menus there, the um, also the music we even changed because we had full orchestra soundtrack by then, so we put that in. So the whole game felt totally different from the Japanese version. and. Um, yeah, you can actually go quite far if you have a good relationship with the development team and you build up that trust. It takes a long time to build up that trust, but um, you can get there. So, yeah, just these are some ideas I'm just throwing out there. Um, now, uh, I mentioned of style there. Um, I will go to the next slide, it does talk about style. So, if you're looking at the system messages, they look very dry, but there's a lot of irony going on. A lot of, um, and the same with the newspaper headlines. There's a lot of, like, uh, you, you basically get an article in a full sentence, and then when you move it across to put it into the newspaper, it's shortened down to a very uh, short headline. Now, once again, headlines change depending on the culture. For instance, if British English, or particularly Australian English, when you have headlines, it's usually puns. Everything's a joke. It's like you, even serious stuff will have the silliest puns in the headline to grab your attention. American newspapers don't do it as much, but even in America, for instance, you'd have New York Times and, uh, say, Wall Street Journal, a very high-level uh, headlines versus, say, US Today versus National Enquirer, which would be pretty, be pretty crazy. In Japan, if you're talking about Japanese newspapers, you have your Asahi, your Yomiuri, your Mainichi, and your um, Nikkei Shimbun, 